Good morning. Good We're morning. here today with Sadi Allen. It's a pleasure to have him here. He was a huge part of our Flowhive crowdfunding campaign and for years beyond working hard to uh, share our Flowhive around the world. And since, he's uh, gone underground and he's got a brand new invention he's been working hard at. He's got it on a crowdfunding campaign and it's called Subpod. Yeah, that's right, Subpod. So Subpod is a subsurface worm farm essentially. So I have um, was working with, with Cedar and the Flow team here for, for a number of years and, and on the side working with another inventor because we're lucky to live in a place where there's lots of really interesting people with great inventions and um, came across this fellow who had created a, an amazing, um, amazingly simple worm farm that really takes a lot of the hard work out of composting. And what was exciting for me was it can work right in your own backyard or it can even scale to commercial size systems and, and it's been a pretty interesting ride for the past couple of years and, and now we're crowdfunding and we're in our last three days of Indiegogo and I'm excited to share it with um, the Flowhive community because I, I really feel a part of it having been, um, been here with the crew for so many years working hard to help, help them get flow to the world. Fantastic. So we'll have a look at the subpod in just a minute. And if you've got questions about the subpod or about Flowhive, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering them. Also, let us know where in the world you're tuning in from and why we're here. We may as well harvest honey. a little bit of honey because I this brings back memory <laughs> cedar. I haven't seen a harvest in about six months now. This um, frames, the honey's just starting to to come down into the tube at the bottom here. And um, we had to get some honey because Sadi not coming into the office much anymore, um, needs some honey on the shelf. That's right. And it's, I've noticed all of the melaleucas flowering around the coast at the moment, which is one of my favorite times of year for honey. It is that melaleuca they call the rain tree. And we've had, we've had a lot of rain recently, so it's just been kicking off. There's been this overwhelming sweet smell of melaleuca drifting into the office. And it, it is just such a beautiful thing to, to have that, those, those flavours and those different uh, scents of the seasons becoming a part of, um, part of daily life. But, so look at that, the honey is just coming out. Yeah. And into the jar. Okay, let's have a look at this sub pod. Sure. Well, coming over here, you'll see there's a garden bed. Um, yeah, we're, we... pretty, we're pretty excited to have it here because for me, um, it's so important that our compost actually gets recycled and all of the nutrients in it get back into the soil. There's an unfortunate situation where a lot of compost is ending up in landfill and in the wrong places where the nutrients doesn't get to be reabsorbed, right? That's right, and it's even a bigger problem of that because um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but when you have food waste and it goes into landfill and it doesn't get composted, it ends up creating a lot of greenhouse gases, which is a really powerful um, problem like we, the the actual methane that comes from compost is 21 times um, worse for the atmosphere than than co2 um, so that's what happens when you don't deal with it properly but when you deal with it properly food waste is an amazing resource and it turns from our waste back into something that feeds life and that's really the process that that's been happening on on this planet ever since it really sparked off and life took hold. There's no waste in nature. And that's really where we have to go as a species, which is why composting is so important. And it's so exciting. Once you get to understand the processes, it's just like beekeeping, a whole world opens up. So it's a really interesting space to be. Can you tell us a bit about how it works? Sure. So as you can see here, this is, doesn't look like your average composting system. You've got just what looks like a seat here in the garden and, and we use it as a seat. We actually have systems um, that are in public spaces where people actually are sitting on it surrounded by food and are not aware that they're actually sitting on compost. Because when you've got the system in the ground like this, 
nature's doing the work. And you can compost on location with no smells at all mess because really worms and microbes, the things that are breaking down all the food, they thrive in the ground. So come and have a look under here. This system was just installed yesterday. So we haven't put food waste in here yet. Um, what we've got here is a whole bunch of worm castings and bedding material. You might even be able to see some worms in here. Ah, oh, look, so look good. Look at you all can, of those worms. You can put that on your muesli. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, there's, the worms take care, right? They, they eat all of the, uh, the food waste you're putting in there, turn it into to good worm casting in an efficient way with, with, with really no smells, right? That's right. So the, the worms, compost worms, because there's different worms, and these ones are compost worms that actually have evolved to eat waste material and to eat the microbes also that are breaking down that waste and no. so they're quite different than the earthworms and they can eat up to the, their own weight in waste every day which is pretty amazing wow. imagine if you could eat as much food as you weigh that that's pretty impressive it is it is <laughs> <laughs> it is so imagine that kids um would love this experience of of having worms in their backyard to to open up and have a look i know my son at home we had a worm farm going for a while and he loved just pulling out the worms and having a look at them and giving them names and things do you find that with the sub pod absolutely um one of the things that i love about the sub pod is is that it's in the ground in this situation you've you've got a really a treasure chest to kids to open up and, and play in and have a look. It's really quite a nice friendly environment in here as you can see there's not any nasty smells, um, there's no mess and mixing it's lots of fun for kids too. Um, using the sub pods very simple when you put your food waste in we just use this compost aerator and you're just literally mixing right. your waste in a few turns when you put your compost in and a couple of handfuls of dry carbon material like paper or or some um, dry leaves with your food waste and and that's it so it's a great way for kids to engage in the garden and learn how the life in here actually feeds the life all around here because everything that we grow depends on healthy soil all of the the food that we grow just like pollinators are really important for the crops that that we grow, the soil and the health of the soil that's provided by all of the organisms, including the, the worms and the microbes and the fungus are vital for our food system. And it's something that we all should understand and appreciate. And I'm, I'm sure you think that too, Sita. Absolutely. And I have to admit, I actually, often we have this compost bucket at home. We, we always compost, but often I leave it till it's totally full and, and overflowing because I don't want to go out to our compost bin because it's actually pretty smelly and anaerobic. Yeah. Now, um, I'm sure a lot of people have that same thing where, where the compost is this kind of messy, you've got to clean the bucket. There's, it, it's it's not, a, not a pleasant experience because of the smell that comes off that anaerobic type of composting that we're used to doing above ground. Now, that's uh, right, and that smell is the smell of those gases I was talking about. Um, so when you've got that really smelly mess happening, it's actually not great for the soil to, like you, it has to break down quite a lot from that point before it's any good for you, your soil. Where If you're composting like this using worms, the worms actually, their gut provides the right environment to break down that food in the right way and the, the microbial mix. So you end up with a really high quality compost um, that's going to be good for your garden right away rather than um, some of the other me methods where you can end up with something that's maybe not ideal. It makes so much sense. In, it, you're, you're shortcutting a whole process of composting, which is often messy and takes up a bit of space and often smelly. And, and for that reason, people in urban environments don't often do it and their compost ends up going in the bin, which is a tragedy. Whereas this is, this is you've just got your food scraps in the kitchen. After cooking dinner, you walk straight out, you tip it in, a handful of straw, close the lid, the worms deal with it, and it's this beautiful thing providing nutrients and moisture into your, into your garden bed. So it's a really direct process and, and, and so simple. It makes so much sense. And do you find that having it underground helps with the, uh, with the temperature of the composting? That's right. So being underground, the temperature's stable. 
um, year round, you don't have those big fluctuations and and worms and, and microbes and fungi, they all like stable temperatures. And so by doing that, you, you're giving it the right environment, the right biology to, to really thrive. And um, having it in a bed like this means you've got all of that biology moving out of the soil. Because I don't know if you can see in here, but the subpod is open to the, um, to the soil here. So the, you're actually having life, worms and microbes moving out into your bed and feeding the soil. Um, which is really great. And, and food waste is also up to 90% water. Um, so when you're composting in your bed, you're not having to actually um, water as, as much in some circumstances. And our team just got back from a pilot project we, we did with an indigenous community out west of here, and they've gone through a really tough drought out there. And their system's still thriving. They had plates of tomatoes and huge amounts of of, um, of pumpkins coming out of their, their bed even after a really long, hard summer because the soil health was great in the bed and the food waste was providing extra water right at the plant root levels to keep everything working well. Amazing. So the nutrients and water just flows out of the subpod into the bed, feeds your garden, so it saves you having to buy fertilisers and put them on your garden, saves you having to do some of that watering, especially if you're low on water seems like a, a great solution. For those that are just tuning in, we've got Sadi Allen here today. Sadi worked with us to, to kick off our crowdfunding campaign. He worked with us for years, helping bring our flow hive to the world. He's since gone underground, and this is the new invention he's working on called the SubPod, which is live on crowdfunding at the moment. We've got some questions coming through. So we if you've have, got questions in the comments below. We have people tuning in from all around the world. Uh, Huey from Victoria is asking, how does it work in the cold climate of Victoria? Sure. So one of the great things about composting subsurface, so you're in the ground, is unless, unless the ground is freezing where you are, it's still going to be a fairly stable temperature down there. So we've been testing subpod in a range of environments um, for the last four years, and we have, we have some early customers in Victoria One's right near a snowfield, um, and the other one's down on the Great Ocean Road. So they're they're quite um, they get quite cold in winter, and the subpod is still working well in those environments. Um, you will notice sometimes if it's really cold for long spells, the worm breeding cycle will slow down a little bit, and maybe the maybe they will go through periods where the the they're not processing waste as fast as as in in really warm temperatures, but that's under some extreme environments. And we've even got people in America now buying them to put under cold frames and, and in greenhouses and things um, in the very coldest parts of, of the US. So it's an interesting um, experiment to see with those guys how it works in those really extreme environments. It's, it's great to see this shift towards people really caring about the environment, our environment, the very matrix of life we all depend on. And it's, it's, of course, the bees are a really important part of that. Without pollination, we're, we're in real trouble. But also our soil, there's something like 60 years of topsoil left on, on our planet, right? Yeah, that's right. It's really important for us, everyone, as a, as a whole society, to be thinking about soil. It's the, the life of everything that we we are. It's where our food comes from, and our current agricultural system is is not set up to to help the soil life thrive. And and we really do need to make a change. And everyone's looking at that. Even people like Bill Gates now are getting on stage with bottles of human poo, talking about how we need to think of um, human sewage as as an important um, fertilizer. And before we get there, we can all start composting and turning our food waste into food for the soil. Mm. and you can spread it around your garden, you can give it to friends. It's just a, a great thing to be involved with. Um, and it's such a simple solution to, to what is often a bit of hard, smelly work in, in your backyard doing composting in a conventional way. So I, th I think it's fantastic to just be straight from the garden into the worm farm, in the ground, straight into the soil. You don't, there's no double handling. There's um, really very um, little work you have to do. 
and there's also this beautiful sense that you've got this microbial bloom and this life in your garden bed which is a lot more than like you, you can often go and buy some soil and bring it in but it, it, it's actually a little kind of void of those microbes it's a whole lot of stuff put together and mixed up but it doesn't have that living structure that that this promotes that all of the organisms growing in here are moving out into your garden bed right they are that's right and and the the soil microbes are so important for us to understand because the the microbes that are in our soil in many ways are mirrored in our own bodies like uh, in our in our own bodies we have more um DNA from other microbial organisms than we have human DNA. So we're really connected to the natural environment in ways that we, we're just starting to understand. And the microbes in here will be in our food, in really healthy soil. These little seedlings will get colonised by a microbial sheath and, they, and those microbes will pr protect the plant from pests and diseases and provide us really um, important nutrients processing in our gut when we eat that plant and this is a, a new area that we're really just starting to understand um, just like with bees bees use microbes as well um, microbes and fungi are really important um, for for bees health I've got another question if you move home can the sub pod move with you sure so with with the sub pod this here is a prototype this is hand built by us um, and we're just moving into manufacture now um, with the real sub pod and we'll be shipping from the end of June. And, and the manufactured version's flat packed, it's easy to assemble. And we also have a small garden bed, but you can, you can certainly pull the, the sub pod out of a garden bed. You could pack up a raised garden bed if you want as well and sh shift it to another location. And we have people who are using sub pods in beds for a year or so, and then moving it to another location in the garden to activate another area, because over time, the soil health in your bed will, will increase. I remember we had all sorts of crazy questions coming in with the flow hive, like, um, can I take it on my bicycle? and things like that. I know you've, you've kicked off with this crowdfunding campaign. There's three more days left of your crowdfunding campaign. Have you been getting any ridiculous questions like that? Can, can you put a sub pod in your backpack? <laughs> well, no, I don't think a sub pod in your backpack would quite work. Um, so we've, we've, had lots of, we've had lots of questions about people wanting to do it on a large scale, which sounds crazy, but the crazy thing is it's not. So like you've got here, a backyard system, but one of the things that's really impressive is we've managed to replicate this system at commercial scale. So we've got a resort in Sri Lanka that has 140 guests at its peak and about 30 staff, and they're doing their whole entire organic waste stream through subpod and and then um, turning their woody waste into biochar, which is another great product to put in the subpod to make excellent compost because Sri Lanka is an island with, and they're already experiencing the problems with agricultural soils that we're talking about. Islands are the canary in the coal mine for the for our soil and, mm. and places like Sri Lanka really value innovations that help them to build their soil health. Absolutely. More questions. Ryan D is asking, if you have need for multiple bins, what spacing would be required between them? So one of the, the great things about Subpod is it's modular. Um, you can put the bins side by side and because there's these holes in the side of the Subpod, once they're in the ground and, and each bin is filled with worms and worm casting and compost, the, the worms will migrate between bins um, to go to where the food source is. So um, in our typical installation that we're doing for commercial communities, we have a series of five of them lined up in a bed about six metres long, and that'll compost about two and a half tonnes of waste a year. So, and a single subpod unit here, if it's used at, at its full capacity, We'll do 15 to 17 kilos of food waste a week once the, once the um, life has built up over a 8 to 12 week period. Um, so for a single family, how many sub pods do you think? You a need? single sub pod um, is ideal for one family. Um, it's quite shocking, but if you look at the statistics in Australia and also the US, we, we throw out about half a tonne of food a year, which is a lot. So the sub pod will handle that amount of food easily and um, if you're composting that volume of waste it's almost as much as 
as not driving a car for six months because of the, the huge effect of the methane gas being 21 times um, more damaging to our greenhouse than the, the carbon dioxide emission. So it really is something that you can do in your own backyard that is great for the soil, it's great for our atmosphere and it's great for our health. Um, just like beekeeping, it's something we should all be doing. More questions. Ryan D has got another excellent question and that is, would roots get into the bin? Will this be a problem? Sure, so with Maybe roots... Repeat, repeat that question for anyone who couldn't hear it. Yeah, so Ryan's asked if roots will get into the bin, the subpod bin, and that, that can happen. And, um, but with, with vegetable roots, they're quite small and you're, you're turning your um, subpod regularly with your worm or compost aerator, which is the tool I showed you before, this one here. And so by the, that action of turning down in here will inhibit the growth of too many roots within the subpod. And if you're in a location like this with lots of trees, um, you can think about putting geotextile fabric down on the bottom to stop the roots of trees getting into your garden bed. And that's quite a standard practice with raised garden beds. And we're, we're going to have a whole lot of resources available to help you to set up your beds just right. Any more questions? Huey's got another question. Is it produced in Australia or America? So with the subpod, um, we've had to go for producing it in China. Um, so we've, we're working with a really good factory over there. They've been fully vetted for, for Western work standards um, and, and work with a number of big brands. Um, it might not look like much, but subpod is very expensive to to produce it's a big box and that's a big mold and as a startup we, we've had to to go that way right now um, but it's a, a very high quality product and we've been working with experts around the world to make sure that we've got a really good product for you and it's going to come with a five-year guarantee um, and the the lid although it's not going to have this wooden seat on it we will be providing um, instructions on how you can clad it if you like, but it'll come with a nice attractive seat top that you can sit on, rated to 250 kilos load. And go and have a look at Subpod on Indiegogo or check out subpod.com to, to see all about um, the, the features in the, in the produced version. Helen has another great question. If you have a raised garden bed that, will, that is long, will this system fertilise the whole bed? Well, in, in that um, scenario, you will get the worms moving over time right throughout the bed, but it can take quite a long time for them to reach the outer, outer limits of your bed. But one of the great things about the subpod for, for people who are a little bit lazy is you can literally, once, you're, once your compost is ready in a large bed and you're ready to, to replant and fertilise, you can literally just get your material out of the subpod and put it around your bed and all of the worms will slowly just travel back to, to the food source. So that's a, a pretty easy way to keep your bed fertilised. Um, and if you're doing this well, you'll probably end up with more material than you can use on a single, a single garden bed. So you'll have plenty to harvest and put around your garden and other, other spots and give to your friends. Sadi, are there different species of worms that are used in the subpod or is there just one strain? So the worms that are used in a subpod or any worm farm are compost worms and, and there's a number of different varieties like um, red wrigglers and tigers and, and blues um, but we don't need to worry too much about the, the subspecies as long as they're a compost worm and they're widely available all over the world. Um, you can, use, you can use any compost worms and we have a mix in our system. How does someone go and uh, acquire a colony of worms? Yeah, so a, a colony of worms or, or a clue of worms. You can, you can get your worms um, right around the world. They're available from garden centres. Um, you can even order worms online, just like you'd be familiar with ordering packages of bees. You can order a box of worms that will turn up and... Um, and we're just at the moment um, forming some relationships with worm farmers and we'll um, hopefully soon be able to, to provide worms when you order the subpod. Amazing, what countries is it available to at the moment? 
So we've got customers now who've pre-ordered via Indiegogo from 29 countries. We're, we're shipping to, to Europe and to the US and, of course, to Australia. And, and then also um, it's been interesting. We've, we've got people in Singapore as well and um, New Zealand, and there's a, there's a whole range. And, and much like we did here with Flowhive of building a community of beekeepers around the world, we're trying to do the same with composting and, and soil saviors and waste warriors and getting everyone using it. So we, we hope to be global very soon. Um, and, and my experience working with you here to, to get Flowhive out to the world has been really valuable in helping us to create that network. Fantastic. Eric is saying that worm bin composting was a gateway to beekeeping for him. Okay, so you're in your backyard, you, you, you're seeing what you can do, you, you have your um, worm farm, you've got, your, you've got your, your garden bed happening and you've got your bees, it's, it, and it's a fantastic compliment to have more than, than just um, a few herbs in your backyard, to, to really have the composting system, to have bees and things that you can do, because it's such a small footprint, there's only this amount of space taken up by a, a beehive or or a sub pod, and it's something that everyone can really do, and it's it's vitally important for us to make sure that our nutrients are being used wisely and not disposed of to create methane gas. And I think there's also this yearning for us humans to to get back to what we know supports us, which is food that is grown from the soil, which is honey that's collected by bees, and and it's fantastic to see this movement of innovation to allow people to do that in, in urban environments in, in a very small footprint. We've got Sadi Allen here today, his sub pods live on Indiegogo and, and it's only live for another three days so if you want to check that out make sure you go to Subpod on Indiegogo and also you can visit his website subpod.com. That's right. And thank you very much for, for all of the questions. We've got one more question. Brad Gaia is asking, do you vermicompost with me? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so with the sub pod, technically it is possible to, to vermicompost with meat, um, but it is a bit more an, of an advanced um, thing to do. So we recommend, just, if you, you're a beekeeper, you'll be familiar with having to to nurture your bees when you first get your colony and it's the same with the worms they need to settle into into the sub pod and build up their numbers and and really get robust over over an eight to twelve week period and then you can start working with some some di different things so meat on the bone we've been able to compost that um, but it, uh, again this is ex experimental so you um, play with it by all means but some of the exciting things we, we can do very easily once it's up to full health is compost things like citrus and onions that um, are a no-no in other systems. I've seen the inventor Andrew dump a 20 kilo bucket of just onions in here and most people would think Whoa. that's going to kill your worms but because we're composting in the ground where, where all of the life wants to be the worms can just move out the sides of the garden bed and the microbes do the work and come in and, and start to break down those onions and then the worms come back and gorge on them and they actually love them. So by just giving them the right environment, um, nature's processes can really deal with a lot, of, a lot of things that we maybe traditionally wouldn't think we can compost. That's amazing. So you're managing to, to push the boundaries of what's traditionally been possible with worms simply by providing an innovative system which, which has benefits of being able to put food waste straight in. There's no double handling. It's in the ground. It's got the temperature sorted out because the ground keeps it regulated. There's no anaerobic systems because there's all holes in the sides and the nutrients is flowing straight into the soil. A, um, a great solution. So if you know anybody that would like to, to um, put one of these in, in their garden, make sure you spread the word. It's really important for us as a species to really get back to putting our, our nutrients straight into the ground and being able to grow our food and, and eat it right in our own backyards. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming in today, Sadi.
thanks for having me. It's great to be back here, Cedar, and, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. And we're, we're live on Indiegogo for another three days at some special early bird prices. So if you want to get behind another great ecological invention, please go and check us out on Indiegogo or via subpod.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Fantastic.